everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Today we have a very special guest, George, who is an aspiring actor, also a poet. Um, yeah, George, so tell us a bit about your writing, what you do, what you get up to. Well, when it comes to my writing, um, I pretty much am um, writing poems when I can, although it's it, it's a weird one being writing because it can be very it can be very hit and miss like you know some few weeks you can write loads and then sometimes you could just not forget but your mind is just completely free of it. But then it just comes in waves so yeah a lot of it's just poetry started when I was fairly you know in my teens and since the last couple of years I've really started building up a bit more of just work in that sense. Would you like put your writing in a genre of particular or is there a particular subject that you tend to write about more? Um, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a genre but I would say that I'm I've written quite a few pieces about nature and the destructive power of it and how the human race is gradually destroying it as we go yeah. as we sort of go on our way to damnation I mean I don't want to put a downer on the whole thing but it's like that thing it's just sort of, you know it's a subject which I think more people should talk about definitely and I know you also mentioned that um you know you kind of feel like there's a stigma sometimes that men can't always like express their emotions like through their writing do you mm-hmm. think there are enough like male honest male voices when it comes to writing and poetry and that sort of thing um well i would say that there's maybe a lack of them but then then again maybe my knowledge of male poets might not as be as high as some other people so i couldn't say for sure but i would say definitely that within especially in young males it's very difficult or it's very uncommon to find people you know guys who are willing just to put all their thoughts out on a page and create something that means something to them which they're happy to share with others because it's that it's that it's that concept of sharing it which I think a lot Mm -hmm. of guys I mean not just guys but I think they can struggle a lot with just sharing how they feel because there is that there is that underlying feeling of oh I can't show possible signs of emotion because then I might look a little bit sort of like weak you know yeah do you, because I was thinking about it the other day, do you think there's just a stigma overall with, I guess, millennials, gen, people that are Generation Z, I think they call it, to like not show your emotions or just be really cryptic about talking about more sensitive things or your emotions? Do you think there's a stigma attached to it? Like you can be perceived as more weak or not being taken as seriously? Um yeah, what do you think about that? Well, I think I think it can it, it it can be very it can be a sort of double-edged sword because you can have I feel like there's a lot of uh let's say effort for people to or Gen Z millennials to push their creative side and create but then also with that you get the extreme opposite of people saying, Oh no, like you know, like, don't do that because that's that's lame or stupid or like, you know, no one wants to hear that. Because so I think the stigma comes from the fact that we're trying so hard to help people feel this way that it creates a sort of polar opposite and it brings out the other extreme side. So I think, you know, the balance is very difficult to find. And I think it's we're on our way to helping people become more open and more creative, but it can it still is pretty much a struggle especially in this day and age. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Do you think, you know, it seems to be more cool if you're, I guess, more of like a cold person or, you know, you're chasing the money or you're, you're not really focused too much on your feelings and all of that stuff? Yeah, well, I, I think there's definitely, there's definitely an attitude problem of a lot of people our age or younger and it's all about like, oh, nothing matters apart from just making... a a load of money and it's like yeah money money helps in life but also it's like you know that's not the that's not the only thing that can because also it's one of those things it's like being creative makes a lot of people happy so it's like there's no point slamming other people for being creative I think a lot of people just you know they're they're very 
bit of a tunnel vision when it comes to some things like that. Yeah. So what writers do you look up to or have inspired you on your journey, I guess, as a writer? Well, I mean, my my uh, my inspiration has hugely come from classic writers, um, sort of like the well-known ones that they teach you about in school, I suppose. I mean, to be fair, sometimes school does um, does ruin writers or books for you, but um, because they put, because especially in like English classes, but I would say I've always been a huge fan of uh, poets like uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, John Keats, Thomas Hardy. But recently I would say also, I've been reading a lot more, a lot more, let's say modern writers. Um, one of my favorite newer poets is um, Ada Limon and she's an American poet. She's absolutely fantastic. She, the way she writes is very visceral. It's very, she creates sort of quite uh, violent images, but also makes them very, you know, they, they also makes them, makes you feel something, you know? Yeah, of course. Um, Cause I guess myself, I'm more of, if you, if I think it's called postmodern, so, I had like a big thing for um, books written by F. Scott Fitzgerald like from the 1920s. I was like obsessed with like the whole Great Gatsby and mm -hmm. that whole time because it just fascinated me because it was it was a long time ago, but it wasn't necessarily a Victorian era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was for me. I think now I'm trying to get more into books that I guess are about maybe the London experience or just more like multicultural experiences mm -hmm. of others. I think that's pretty important as well. Yeah. 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 It, it's interesting to do that because also I, um, I also started reading a lot of Benjamin Zephaniah. And I think Benjamin Zephaniah is a perfect example of a poet who, or just a writer in general, who's sort of mixed, who's really integrated his own culture or his roots into something into a plate you know he's been in England pretty much all of his life and he's really painted a great picture of how cultures have intertwined and again he's also a fantastic writer so I think yeah it's yeah especially, especially when he talks about his experiences of living in somewhere like Birmingham and then he's could also he's also written poems about other places and what you were saying like understanding the London experience it's like when you can have someone who's from this place and they can create an image that's really amazing yeah like you can almost through the, that person's story you can feel their experience through the whole thing pretty much yeah which is pretty cool um do you feel that there is like a a writer or a poet that represents the uk voice or the london voice or the different voices um, it's difficult because I think society now, well, I mean, I say society as a general, when, when you, even looking at, if we're going to stick to like representing somewhere like London, it's very difficult to pick out a specific writer who is the voice of today, because there's so many different sectors that, oh, so you froze a little bit, um, there's so many different sectors, there's so many different parts, cultures that they all it's very difficult to pick out one. So I'm not entirely sure I could say one who would be the voice necessarily. Yeah. But are there any that come to mind that you think, oh yeah, this this really, or like maybe reminds you of, because I know that you said you're London born and raised, like has there any, has there been any that you've read that makes you, oh, that reminds me of my childhood or that reminds me of when I was coming of age or that reminds me of where I grew up or my experience today, anything like that. Yeah, um, that's, a bit, that's quite a tough one because um, honest, off the top of my head, I really can't think to be honest. Um, I think, well, if we're gonna sort of move away from necessarily just writing or poetry necessarily, I think the big, one of the biggest things for me that made me feel or made me think that's, that's what London is all about is when you listen to a lot of like, um, especially a lot of up and coming like UK hip hop rappers or 
grime artists who sort of represent the sort of gritty nature of London and how it's got a very big underground scene. Um, I'm sort of deviated away from writers, but I think that's, yeah. but then again, also like a lot, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of rappers and such, like they are poets in their own right. And they're, they're poets in their own right. So I think, yeah, um, again, I, it's hard no, to I pick. It's hard to that. pick That's true because rap, rapping is a form of poetry. It derives from that. So yeah, yeah you're definitely right about that. 100%. Um, I was going to say a funny story because I, the school I went to was South East London. And I know there's a lot of stereotypes with schools in that area. Um, when I was well, South East London, South East London in general. <laughs> yeah, South East London in general. Um, yeah, so when I was, I think maybe year 10 or 11, um, so the whole social media thing was quite new, but basically there was this girl who wrote this story called Keisha the Skit. And it was a thing where people would pass the story around via text. So you would read it. You, the, she basically would send each chapter via text and then you would read it as you go along. And the story was basically about this girl who I think from memory she was like quite promiscuous and just just basically all the things that she would get up to pretty much and the way it was written a lot of I guess the teenagers at the time it was quite interesting for us and I guess because it was written in text format um it would be easier for a teenager to read I suppose Anyway, um, very recently, it just so happened that that girl actually published the book. And I think it's actually been on some blogs basically saying that her book basically is in a way the voice of like working class black British people. So she published the book, she has a podcast. And I don't know, I just found it really interesting because I think we do need um I guess more honest and diverse writers I suppose um because you know the UK London has changed a lot since the Charles Dickens days as, as it was yeah. I think it's yeah. like to yeah I had I had no idea that she actually published the book um, interesting. and it's just crazy because I remember reading it when I was at school then you know, you forget about it and then all of a sudden it's resurfaced again. I think people are just having a lot more appreciation for other cultures in the mm -hmm. UK, London and how, um, how much of a big part we've become of the UK culture, which I think is pretty mm -hmm. great. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think also, especially with um, because you look at the examples of like hip hop and all that, like that's yeah. comes from black culture and that's brought with it um, a lot of, uh, let's say, mix ups. That so, you, so nowadays spoken word is such a huge thing. And that comes from, I mean, spoken word is just speaking, but there's so much rhythm attached to it. There's so much like musicality attached to it. And then you look at the example, I don't know, like, a, so have you heard of Loyal Kana? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. So, so some someone like Loyal Kana, like he's a rapper, but then the way he raps is almost like spoken words, and you can tell that yeah, he brings yeah. so he brings so much um, inspiration from his culture and his understanding of music. And like him, like someone, for example, like him, he went to the Brit School, which is a you know quite a big performing arts school in South yeah, London. Huge, yeah. And yes, yeah. So it's like you you have an example of him who had the you know the, he going back to your previous question about the stigma of being creative like he had the option to be creative and he took it and he took used it to his advantage so i think that is something we you know should more people should have the opportunity to have you know be able to express themselves the way he does yeah and i just i think i just love the appreciation of it as well um of the different voices but yeah yeah Laura khan is great Tom Mish, all of them, fantastic. Can't, can't, be, a bit, can't be a bit of Tom Mish. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, it's pretty cool. So on that same pathway, do you think, like, if there was a book or there was literature for young people today, like, what kind of subject matter or genre do you think they would, I guess, gravitate towards? Because, you know, I think a lot of young people, a lot of teenagers, they don't really read as much as they used to, so... Mm. It, it's it's a tough one because I think you know it's it's that age old saying of like you never know until you try it but then also it's very difficult to get a child to well like some a lot of children nowadays to just try something to maybe you know to try this book you might like it and it's very easy for them to pick up a book and be like or some sort of writing is like oh, I don't like it and then that puts them off so I think if we were to pick a subject or a mixture of subjects that could work, I think it would be, I mean, that's, it, it's quite tough, but I think, especially, I think there's a big, there's a big thing today where, where kids have a very big connection to where they're from. So I think, simply writing like something that they could get into and basing it upon a place that they're from and make it very clear that this is like a, oh this is an experience of somewhere which you might relate to I think that could be a quite quite a big pull factor just to make them think oh like I might relate to that or I might find that interesting you know yeah yeah so you're saying about the subject that you think young people would be interested in reading about? I think um, I think one of the biggest, because it, like I was saying before, it's difficult for a lot of kids to just have the initiative just to pick up a book and just try it, you know? So I think um, if we're going to talk about subjects which could grab them, especially if, let's say, we're talking about kids who are from London, you know, they all that stuff, like they, I think um, if you're, if a book is written and it's about an area of London or it's about or it's about being part of that place or being part of something, part of a community, I think that would definitely attract them because they think, oh, I'm I'm from London. Like that book's about, so about a person yeah. or like a story of this place or someone who's from there. It's like, let's mm -hmm. see what, you know, maybe I relate to it or maybe it's a cool story and I can visualize the places that are being said because I know it possibly. So I think, you know, it's, I think location is quite a big, yeah big thing in terms of like store, you know stories any kind of writing so I think if that can appeal to people who are local or from the place that definitely has a pull factor yeah what do you think about exploring just different things that young I guess people of this generation can relate to in books I mean it could be that it's already been done but just for example things like the whole transgender thing yeah, and yeah. sexuality and just all of those things like I don't want to assume that those books are not already out there but do you think exploring those kind of topics would you know bring more younger people in to read more because those are things that we're kind of dealing with and exploring now as a society well, I think, I think definitely, I mean, again, I don't want to assume that uh, like you, that there are things that there aren't books out there, yeah. which do, um, but I mean, I think, I think the point is like, there's not, there's not, there's not like a spotlight for those kind of things. And I don't necessarily think there should be, but I think definitely yeah. if, if new books or some sort of story or some sort of writing was released and it was probably done maybe say the writer is of an age of this generation where they can write in a way which is relatable to people who are of their age and younger and it can be a personal experience it could be just simply explaining a situation of of someone let's say understanding their sexuality is grow in growing up i think definitely there's a market and there's definitely a calling for more of those things to come out no <laughs> pardon the pun mm. um well, but even yeah. things like bullying, I mean, again, I don't want to assume those books are not out there, but mm. just bullying or even just the pressures of social media and 
just all of those things like right? social media pressure yeah, things like that definitely think what you I definitely think um books or anything that can talk about social media and the dangers of it is something that really should be given a lot more prevalence because I think you know this the world in general is developing so quickly that everyone soon is is going to have some sort of like you know smartphone tablet or where they attach themselves to and they've got this social media which they sort of create this persona with and don't get me wrong that I don't think there's I don't think it's inherently bad, but I think there's plenty of, I think there's plenty of opportunities for people to read up and understand how these things can be damaging and how you can regulate them, how you can, you know, how, mm. and, 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 and like, you know, because what comes with a lot of social media, like you've, you hear stories about like, oh, this person was beaten up because someone like, someone like, because they said something on social media and it's like all these schoolyard things. And I think definitely if you're going to attract, you know, um, kids to want to read more if they read a story about how these things about about these sort of stories they can definitely understand the dangers and or you know the sort of risks of these things yeah definitely I agree I think I agree with you I think I was more thinking along the lines of if there was a fictional story yeah but it but it explored the things that young people go through today. Yeah, um, I, mean, I think I think to be no, I was um, what what I was saying was that I definitely think if it was like a fictionalized kind of setting, that definitely if they had <laughs> if they created, if they created. I mean, it's like for example, like young um, uh, films that are made today that tackle. So let's say for more like young adults when they they've made films like and tv shows like top boy and blue story which tackle gang violence and obviously they're fictionalized but they're very eye-opening in terms of the danger mm. and like so definitely if yeah, maybe true, you, yeah so if you like did that yeah. for like the dangers of social media or something like that and kids can relate to it and understand that and for and relate to a character who fights for people to be a bit more understanding in that sense yeah definitely of course yeah Yeah. So yeah, I think we've covered quite a bit so far. Yeah. Yeah, so like um in schools nowadays, how would you how how do you think we can appeal to children more to actually pick up a book and read? Like how do you think schools should go about actually making them more feel more inspired to actually read and pick up and or write themselves mm. I think the thing is like and I was having this discussion with my sister the other day I think I think the schools do a lot to be honest like the schools sometimes do more than the parents do in terms of encouraging if you want to call it forcing the children to read I just yeah. think it's the book I think it's the text are just too old. Um, I myself, I have, I was like a teaching assistant. And right, when right. I would have my GCSE students, they would really struggle with like, for example, Macbeth and the spectacles. And they're great texts, they're great. Macbeth, I love Macbeth, but they just can't really relate to it. And yeah. I think it's just because every year, those texts become less and less relevant. Um, so I just I just think it's just having texts that are more relevant would get the kids like they won't just read at school, but they'll make the effort to read and study at home as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, when it comes to little children, it's hard to say because they have all these gadgets now. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would just have to be the effort with the parent to maybe find a way maybe the child can read from the screen or when they're smaller it's hard but I know like sometimes when I go into the bookshop there's loads of books for little children there's a lot like pretty much on anything yeah um but I think it's more the teenagers. I think sometimes the books that they choose for the kids to study are just a little bit too out of context. I mean, what do you think? 
well, interesting, like what you were saying, like, you know, when a lot, because obviously when uh, GCSE students are studying for English, like, it's like you said, it's normally something like Macbeth or, you know, an old yeah. text. And don't get me, and don't get me wrong, like, you know, I'm, I'm a huge, I love Shakespeare and all that. And to be honest, whenever I was studying it, I didn't have an issue, but I can understand that, especially the writing itself is so different to how we speak, even, you know, and all that stuff. And yeah. it's like, if you're going to pick a, if you're going to pick a subject or you're going to pick a book, which for kids to study, then yeah, pick something that was well written, but at least something which maybe is a little bit more of this time, because, you know, there's only so much you can get out of a story which was written 500 years ago, purely just for the basis that it was beautifully written. You know, I think it's, I think especially England has this problem while well, the Britain in bread gemmas, this problem was being like, Oh, we need to, you know, you know, we need to make sure Shakespeare is always in school. I'm like, don't get me wrong, I love Shakespeare, but it doesn't have to be taught everywhere, you know? No. And I think that's the issue. Like, the more that you keep pushing Shakespeare and all these other writers, it means that that kind of more modern voice of England or London is lost because there are people <laughs> writing things and doing things, but no one will ever know if you keep going on about Shakespeare. <laughs> Shakespeare is fantastic, but the world has changed a lot since um, Shakespeare. I remember when I was doing um, my A levels, we studied this writer called Chaucer. <laughs> and uh, Chaucer. Uh, the book that he wrote, it was like the oldest text that was, that's ever been written. We literally, each lesson would have to go through, would we'll spend like a whole lesson trying to dissect one I think it's like called a stanza or what it was called yeah, yeah. It, it would take that long um so yeah I, I think all of that stuff is not necessary now um I don't really think we need to go any further back than maybe the mid 1970s I don't really think we need to go any further back than that or maybe the six well, I think, I think, uh, I think it's like, it's like there should be options you know if people want to study classic texts then they can or if they you know if they I just I mean obviously it's difficult when you've got you know a whole year group full of like let's say year 11s doing GCSEs or year 12s doing and year 13s doing <laughs> A levels and such and you do get a bit of choice while you're there from what I remember especially when I was at six mm -hmm. and I got the choice to pick some certain texts but it's like it's only a couple and you think well all of these are quite old all of these are all that stuff and you just think yeah. it'd be nice to have something which is a little bit closer I mean luckily for me I was able to study um alongside a very old text I managed to study um a clockwork orange which is quite a which is probably the closest modern text you can get in the yeah. school system right now so like that was amazing because it was like okay we've got something which is much closer to this time it's very different it's interesting and you've got something which is older so then you've actually got the comparison mm. so it's like I just think you know the point is especially with like a lot of um, examples they, they just need to mix up the options they need to be more options and just get rid of some of the deadwoods because you know mm. there's only so much we can keep going back to the Macbeth, you know, like, yeah. it's also, and also if you're going to do Shakespeare, there are so many Shakespeare plays, you don't have to have Macbeth and Hamlet, there are so many more, yeah. you know? But, you know, Macbeth is great, like, I think Macbeth of is, of is one of the more exciting ones, hmm. but then I guess it depends what you're interested in, but yeah. I definitely agree with you all the way, um, I just think, unfortunately, it means that there's a lot of writers that are not getting the, I guess, attention they deserve because there's still a lot of focus on Charles Dickens, yeah, Shakespeare, um, Emily Bronte, the Bronte sisters. Yeah, we're we're still looking to the past where maybe we need to recognize that things have changed since that time yeah well, we can't stay stuck we can't stay stuck too far back you know we need a little bit of progression yeah definitely all right well on that last note who what are you reading at the moment or what if you're not reading what do you plan to read 
um, at this uh, moment in time. Uh, like I said, my one of uh, Reese, well, not discovered her, but I've recently started reading a lot more of Ada Limon, and she's a really, really great American poet. I've just been going through little like just finding finding all kinds of poems by her. Um, in terms of actual books and such, I've not picked up a book in a while, admittedly, but um, I definitely think if I'm, I definitely want to try and maybe pick up like a, make, make, maybe some sort of a fantasy, maybe see what, see what, see what's out there, look for something new, you know? Yeah, definitely. All right, George, it's been great speaking to you. It's been a very interesting discussion. And yeah, I, I think in time we will see more modern books coming, coming into the curriculum and all that. I hope, I hope so. Yeah. Do you think, I guess my very last question is, do you think reading will like ever completely go out of fashion? Do you think people will one day maybe give up on writing in that way altogether? Or do you think maybe it will be revived somehow i think i think be, i think it will be revived or revitalized in some way because i just think um although there is the potential for so many people not to read anymore it still is pretty much everything that life revolves around you know like you know history is written through writing history and all this stuff and i think the only way things are going to change is if the new style of writing comes in and takes the world by storm, I suppose. I mean, to be honest, like I've been reading a lot of like books. Well, last year I was reading a lot of books which um, are basically integrated verse or poetic verse into, into actual like literary texts. So it's like, you never know, maybe that might become very, quite a big thing because, you know, yeah. you can sort of, you know, it, I mean, again, and also the bridge between like writing literature and writing music and creating that, you never know, there might be an even bigger sort of mix up that can be created that might revitalize our want to write and or read. Yeah. I mean, it could be in the future, the kids are studying, maybe they'll be analyzing rap or grime lyrics, you know? Um, yeah. And maybe the whole <laughs> reading book thing will become will be vintage it might become like a vintage you know like how people buy what's it called here people buy records and stuff mm -hmm. they say it's vintage maybe buying a book will be like yeah. a vintage a vintage thing to, to do <laughs> well it will because it's also like you know podcasts have become so big nowadays like so many people are like oh i don't not read a huge amount, but I listen to a podcast every day and it's like, well, maybe that's going to become the new norm, you know? Like instead of people just picking up a book, they just play a podcast, which I don't think is a bad thing at all because you can learn a lot. But then also you think, wow, the world's becoming very dig digitalized, you know? It is. It could be, it's like a vintage thing to read a book. Mm. Yeah. Having like, having like a collection on your wall. Oh, I, like, oh. I went to the thrift store and I got a book. I got <laughs> books that were from... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely see that. <laughs> All right. Well, it was great speaking today. Thank you for having and... me. Yeah. All right. Bye. <laughs>